My name is Lonnie Ridgway, and thank you guys for joining. And I am here with Karen Malcolm Smith. Can you remind me what organization you're with? The David Dillon Foundation. David D Dillon Foundation. Mm -hmm. What is it? I started the David Dillon Foundation a year after my son passed away mm -hmm. of an overdose. He died in 2017, and then I started the organization in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, it's an advocacy program for destigmatization to honor the people that we've lost to addiction and to help people step out of the shadow of shame that are in addiction for community to honor who they are as human beings. Well, so, so as, as one of the things that we do, that I do as a coalition director over at VOA for you know, our listeners and viewers that oversee uh, the prevention aspect for substance misuse amongst adolescents. Mm -hmm. And one thing that really intrigued me when we first talked on the phone was when you were sharing your story about your son. And I was wondering if you would share your story, because I think a lot of people would benefit from, you know, the words that you have. Okay. Yeah, so please do. Okay. Well, where do I start? Dylan was born in 1992. Um, he was born seven weeks after my husband died. He had a rough beginning because of it was in my own addiction, addicted to alcohol and cocaine. And I'm left, and, and actually didn't even realize that I was addicted. I was, it was something that we did for fun during the 80s. Of course, when I got pregnant, that was the end of it. But sure enough, you know, um, I started, that was in my toolbox. And so when my husband died, I crossed that invisible line that they talk about, where you're no longer doing it because you like to do it, but because you have to do it. And that was, my go-to place for escape. I actually moved to Arizona and I quit and cold turkey for a couple of years and then I actually got into reco actual recovery. So we had the best, he had an awesome childhood after that. He had a rough beginning though. Yeah. You know, as he grew older, ex we're able to share that experience of him not having a father mm -hmm. and me not having the love of my life and us not being the family that we hope to be so we made the best of it we had a, a really tight bond and it was just the warmest beautiful childhood and I, I've really been reminiscing a lot lately uh, I think it's fought the change of seasons it's real emotion evoking for me yeah and I'm, I was remembering um, When a storm would come, then we'd both get really excited and go outside on our roller blades mm. and let the wind whirl us around in the street. And it was this connection with God that we both felt together. And I, I'm really as grateful as I am. I, I miss him. Yeah. Um, that's beautiful. Really wonderful memories. And so, as he got older, um, he was a good student. You know, he had his issues like everybody else. He acted out a little bit in school. And I had to go to the principal's office a lot. <laughs> you know, yep. he kind of had his own way of doing things. And as he got older, he started showing these signs of these qualities, like these character qualities that of um, generosity and loyalty. He, he was always there for the underdog. I watched it with animals. I watched it with his friends. He always had your back if you were his friend. And I really admired that about him. Uh, when he was about 10 years old, I remarried and moved back to Alaska. And right about that time, my uh, my new husband, who was actually a friend of Dylan's father's and had been in our life since Dylan was a little boy, and it was actually kind of a surrogate father that Dylan knew. Um, so we ended up getting married, and and what I didn't realize was that uh, he, he drank too much. Mm -hmm. And it progressed, and, and he was had built, built himself up quite a business, and years after we got married, he was selling it. And, and there was a lot of stress, um, late nights and a lot of drinking on his part. So that was really unhealthy for our family unit. Dylan, when about the time he was 14 years old, we had a cabin 
we were at the cabin and um, we went on a four wheeler ride, Dylan and his friend on mm -hmm. one, and myself and I on the other, and his other little friend on the other one. Well, <clears throat> we went and got some ice cream in Saldana, and then we took off on the trail to come back to the cabin. And I was about two minutes in front of the other four wheeler, and I stopped for a minute and waited for them to catch up. And the next thing you know, my phone rang. And it was the kid that was on the back of Dylan's four wheeler and said, come quick, there's been an accident, Dylan's hurt. I was just really struck by all this happened at once. Here's the fire truck, my son's bleeding at the mouth. His lung had collapsed. He had broken scapula, six broken ribs, um, bruised heart and kidney, torn liver, and traumatic brain injury. Mm. And he was almost dead. So he was in this accident and afterwards um, he was in ICU for two weeks. Mm -hmm. He was on um, massive amounts of hydrocodone or oxycodone, Percocets, and morphine sometimes for three months. And then they cut him off without a taper. Well, all of a sudden, Dylan took a left turn. He started drinking and smoking weed. He didn't, he lost interest in school. And so we're asking my son, what's wrong with you? We should have been asking what happened to you. Mm. We didn't know. Yeah. At the time, nobody knew anything about opiates. So what happened with Dylan, um, he graduated from high school. So he's about 18 and, at this point. Yeah, he's 17. He had an early birthday and he graduated at 17 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, he told me later that we left him in Arizona. He wanted to stay, you know, and hang out with his friends for a week. and. He was 17 years old, just graduated. We thought, okay, a week is fine. So he stayed, and he later told me that that was the first time he tried um, heroin. Mm. And we didn't have conversations about heroin. Right. We didn't, we didn't do heroin. Yeah, really. you didn't know to have conversations. We didn't know to have yeah. conversations about heroin. So the way it's set up is that they use the pills. And then the cartel is very strategic, especially in border towns, border areas like Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And they supply everybody with more pills and then they run out and the only thing they have is heroin right so now all of these people all these people that are dealing pills the only thing they have is heroin so now you're going to withdrawals and you try and you use the heroin and then you're addicted and then you get you're stuck yeah and that's the beginning and then so i found out uh, shortly thereafter that dylan had been using i found a needle and he confided in me um he ended up going to treatment willingly but he was young, and it, unfortunately, you know, it happens to so many, so many young people. Their executive thinking doesn't really develop till they're 25 years old, mm -hmm. and um, they're just not connecting the dots. And they want to have fun, and they want to, you know, go out with their friends, and they don't want to miss out. And um, so the spiral started. Wow. And he'd go for long periods of time and be sober. So I really got to. I got to be with my son, mm -hmm. you know, as a human being. And during that whole time, he kept maturing, and I, I was just so proud of him. And I, I can't even tell you, oh, for me, what it felt like, because he was such a fine human being, and he really took an interest in people. He could go for a long conversation, not once, talk about himself, because mm -hmm. he was really interested in you. Yeah. And I felt like that was, I was so proud that God gave me this boy. He was a boxer. I want to show you the picture, man. Yeah. So handsome. Yep. And a dog, Nas. And Nas, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, really, really handsome guy and um, could have been a golden glove. Yeah. Well, he, um, he relapsed again. He turned 25, May 1st. And in June, he went to a music festival. And he met a girl at a music festival. Little did he know that the girl was connected to a big heroin ring. Mm. But she came into his house and turned his house into a trap house. Fed him drugs the whole weekend. And um, it was the first time ever that Dylan had said to me, I'm not going to relapse again. I'm staying sober no matter what it takes. And um, on June 5th, he kicked her out of the house at four o'clock in the morning. And she told him that my boys will be back to get you. And at noon he died. And we don't know what happened. Mm. You know, he had heroin in his system 
And it looks to me from the toxicology report that um, he had quanapin, which is a benzodiazepine that slows the heart down and you put it with opioids and it's fatal and it stops the heart. So I got the call and um, So, um, it's a a life sentence for somebody when you lose your child. Mm -hmm. I've been able to take that pain that I have and turn it into something good. And my conscious thoughts are, I can't let my son die in vain. Mm -hmm. Something good has to happen. Something good has to come of this. And so that's why I started the David Dillon Foundation. And I think about all the struggles that he had. And most everything that I do now is about stigmatization. It was such a hamper um, for him and for other people that are trapped. And there's a poem that I, I really love um, in the end. And I say it to myself every, every day as a prayer. When all that's left of me is love and give me away. And so that's what I do. And I try to remember every day with all the people that I love that we may not have tomorrow. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that too. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, Thank you for asking me to come here. Yeah. One of the things I do want to highlight is because I think prevention is such a gray area. Um, I just want to kind of talk to some of our viewers a couple of ways that we can engage in prevention. I gave this book to Karen, and one of the ways it's easy to engage in prevention is just literally reading and catching up on the latest uh, material or studies. I brought a couple of things too. Have you ever seen this before? Oh yes. Yeah, so these are medication <laughs> disposal bags. Uh, and awesome. I, I argue that everybody who has prescription medications in their home needs to have this in their home. And so when you're done with your prescription meds and you have all of those left over that you didn't use, you can follow these directions and you can get rid of them. And literally, you pour it in here, mix water in there, shake them around, and it just neutralizes it and you can throw it in the trash. Um, and so I think that's really important. And there's one other thing is this. And so this is actually, is so I just, it. so I just ordered a bunch of this and VOA has a lot of this stuff to give out to our community members, but this is literally a lockbox. Um, and so medication, prescription medications, if you have some of you going camping oh. or if you have kids or anything like that, you can put them in here and you can put that on your Very phone, cool. which is the uh, code and you can lock it up and no one can get inside of it unless, you know, they have a chainsaw handy. But just, <laughs> this is a little bit more safer. Than what are they made of? I, I think they're just, uh, they're just positive. like, yeah, I think it's just a step the child further. Safety. Exactly. Yeah. Just a little step further. Yeah. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Now, are you guys still giving out the Narcan kits? Yep. And we have Narcan kits as well. And so all of this stuff is we have resources for our community members. And so we were trying to find uh, people that might be uh, in your situation back then who's just like, I don't know. I know that this is, I see my son going through this or I've gone through this. What prevention opportunities are out there or what resources are out there? Um, and I just, you know, want to put their VOA Alaska has a lot of resources. One last thing, can you, uh, there's probably some parents or some people that are in the situation where they see their kids with the wrong crowd, with the wrong community, and maybe engaging in these high-risk communities, what would you say to them to encourage them just in this moment, in this season that they're in? To keep a close eye. Mm -hmm. Keep a close eye on your children. And don't be afraid to set some strong boundaries. I think we have a tendency to let our kids have a little bit too much leeway these days. The other thing that I would do, if you do have a child that's addicted, I would really recommend, um, there's a lot of programs out there, but Niranon has really saved me and taught me how to take care of myself. Um, so just the whole thing is just really, it's not just that person that's using that's affected, it's its called a family disease. Yeah. Well, well I'm Lonnie Ridgway with the VOA Alaska Coalition Director, that's me, and this is Karen Malcolm Smith. The David Dillon Foundation. Yes. And thank you for sharing your story. You're welcome, Lonnie. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Absolutely.